Uh, I'm going to say hi. Uh, my name is John Schieber. I'm a senior editor with TechCrunch. I uh, cover all sorts of things related to tech, uh, including but not exclusively related to energy. Um, and today we have a very distinct uh, privilege and honor to be speaking with Vince Cerf, who is um, a man who probably needs no introduction, along with Bob Kahn. Vince Cerf sort of invented the internet. Uh, not like Al Gore invented the internet, but like Vince Cerf invented the internet. Um, it is amazing to have you here, sir. You're lucky you're not actually here because I'd make you sign an autograph. This is the only time I would ever fanboy out about tech. But goddamn, this is so cool. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Our theme is the galactic internet, which is of interest probably to everyone because it's just cool. But uh, before we start talking about about um, things uh, celestial, let's start off with things that are, that are more on terra firma. And we'll start with, with sort of your view of where the internet is right now and then, then, then talk a bit about what's going on in the energy world. Um, so you're Google's chief internet evangelist. Um, when you think about evangelizing the internet right now, what is the biggest opportunity for, for the internet's expansion um, in, in the 21st century? Well, I think the most important uh, avenue for internet expansion is going to be the use of mobiles because they are the most rapidly spreading communications device available. They're typically smartphones now, and they uh, largely give you access to almost all the internet uh, capabilities. So that's the avenue by which uh, the next several billion people are likely to get online. I'm hoping, of course, that what will follow after that is uh, fiber, for example, and much higher speeds, uh, and other devices like laptops and tablets and so on. But that's clearly the vector that we're on right now. Uh, I think I also have to say that uh, we are also moving into a territory that some people call the Internet of Things. These right. are appliances that are programmable, that have communications capability, and are also part of the Internet. And anyone who thinks a little bit about this will very quickly realize that safety, security, and privacy are three big issues related to not only the Internet of Things, but other devices that we use on the network. <clears throat> so that's going to be a big challenge uh, mm. for, for everyone. Uh, the, in the long run, it's my hope as the chief Internet evangelist at Google <laughs> that everyone on the planet that wants to be online will have the opportunity to get online at an affordable price and also with all the accessibility that they may need, including people who might have disabilities, hearing impairments, visual impairments, motor impairments, uh, and that the devices and systems that are uh, made available through the internet uh, accommodate uh, their needs as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm generally optimistic about things because the net has grown pretty dramatically since its earliest days and it doesn't show any real sign of uh, slowing down. So when, when you think about the biggest threats, you mentioned that security is, is one of the issues, and you've said in repeated interviews that software is the, the sort of bedevilment of your, your invention um, with all of the bugs. Is, is security to you the biggest threat um, from, for both IoT and the broader internet, or, or is there anything else that might um, be an obstacle to its growth right now? So this is a very uh, perceptive question. It's clear, of course, that bugs get um, uh, exploited by people who would like to uh, penetrate operating systems, get access to people's devices and, and files and uh, information and so on. But uh, the, these, are, these bugs uh, are the means by which uh, this happens. The motivation to do it, though, is probably the bigger threat. Those are people who simply don't have other people's interests uh, at heart and who, uh, who want to exploit the system uh, for their own benefit and gain or even just to harm other people. Uh, so this poses a real problem because the general public is on the internet. Mm -hmm. And when the general public is involved in anything, you get the full swath of you know, good guys and bad guys and everybody in between. So in some sense, our own social systems, to say nothing of our legal uh, systems and our uh, ecological and economic systems, uh, are all um, sort of fair play for some of this kind of abuse. And so mm -hmm. we, have ha we are going to have to exercise uh, all the tools that we have ever had to use before and maybe new ones in order to corral abusive behavior on the network so we can all take advantage of its most uh, uh, useful aspects. 
Well, so that leads me to an interesting question that I'm going to pose to you in one second. Um, but before I do that, one housekeeping note as more people file into the room. I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible with y'all. And the way I want to do that is with Twitter. So if y'all can tweet at me if you have questions for Vint that you'd like to pose, you can tweet at me. It's my first initial last name, J-S-H-I-E-B-E-R. And uh, I'll review your questions and uh, pose them if they are intelligent and mock them soundly if they suck. Um, so be warned, <laughs> be warned. Um, that said, uh, I want to talk about the Apple FBI kerfuffle for a second that seems to have been largely solved by the FBI by circumventing Apple. But I'm, I'm wondering where, where you fall uh, on, on this notion of the, the tension between security online and privacy and the ability for, for folks to freely and fairly uh, navigate the internet as they wish, whether that's porn or, or you know, the edification of mankind. So uh, this, of course, is a, a very complex topic. But uh, first, let me start out by saying I believe privacy is very important and that we should, we should not give that up lightly. Uh, second, uh, the specific uh, issue between Apple and the uh, FBI uh, had to do with uh, Apple being forced to generate a piece of code, not that would decrypt something, but rather that would allow the FBI to do multiple tries of the uh, pin on that device in order to log into it effectively. Uh, and Apple, I think, correctly resisted creating such a general purpose tool under court order, which eventually would have escaped and made all uh, cell phones vulnerable to that particular uh, attack. Uh, in the end, uh, the particular version of the uh, Apple phone uh, it turned out not to have all of the protections of their most recent model. <laughs> and so I, I don't know any details of uh, who helped uh, the FBI circumvent the security of that particular model. Uh, but obviously something happened. Um, so I'm, I think that they took the right uh, position on this. Mm -hmm. And you will have heard other people who are talking about the crypto question, right. which I want to say it set aside as distinct from the, um, the pin attack question. Uh, and people even who have been former directors of uh, NSA, for example, are saying that security uh, is very important, mm -hmm. that privacy is important, that cryptography is necessary and useful. It does pose a, char a challenge for law enforcement uh, that's trying to protect citizens from, uh, from bad guys. But I think we need to remember that it's not just technical means that allow us to exercise uh, this protective uh, response. There are a lot of other things, including uh, human intelligence and, uh, and the demand for other records that are not necessarily encrypted uh, that uh, assist uh, law enforcement. So we all recognize we want to live in a world that we, in which we and our children and our friends feel safe. Uh, at the same time, I think we all value privacy as well. So finding our way through this um, uh, question will take some time and experience because the internet changes a lot of uh, what is normal uh, because its, it's presence is, uh, is so um, uh, pervasive. Right. So I'm sure we'll get there. I think we managed to deal with other technological developments uh, in the past. So I'm not uh, afraid that we won't find the right path, but it may vary from country to country and from society to society. Uh, you talk about the pervasiveness of the internet and its, its sort of ubiquity. And um, there's an interesting sort of dynamic at play, I think for this audience, especially being an energy audience, between networks of information and networks of power. Um, you can't have technology without electricity. You can't, um, you, well, I mean, you have some forms of technology, but specifically the internet and computing and all of these other great things that we've been using since the invention of the light bulb uh, wouldn't exist without, without, without electricity or power. So what is your sense of the interaction between networks of information and networks of power right now? How, how do they interplay and how will that change over the next five, 10 years? Uh, so there are actually several fascinating interactions that I would anticipate. Uh, one of them is to use computer power and networking communications to manage power uh, in this generation and distribution. What is particularly important, and I'm sure your uh, audience will appreciate this, is that we're moving from a central power generation and distribution paradigm to a very distributed power generation paradigm in which 
the uh, consumers, uh, in, you know, industry, business, government, and so on, not only consume power, but also generate it. And to build a system which is stable under this uh, you know, diverse power generation and consumption condition is hard. Yeah. And I think we are still learning you know, how to accomplish that. Networking and communications are going to be very important. So that's one aspect. Second thing is that um, the Internet of Things, the, uh, some of you will know about the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel that uh, was uh, set up by the Department of Energy and the Department of Commerce, are focused on trying to find standards and protocols that will allow uh, data to be collected and feedback to be given to users to explain to them what the consequences of their life choices are or lifestyles are. So when you get the bill at the end of the month and you wonder, how, how did I use that many <laughs> kilowatt hours? You should actually be told, and that's because you washed the, your clothes in the middle of the uh, hottest time of the day when the air conditioner was running or uh, you know, you were uh, you were using the air conditioner uh, at peak load, right. and so we, we had to charge more. That feedback may actually guide us to make better use of power than we have in the past. Uh, so I, you know, I see this very um, fluid uh, kind of interaction between networking, communications, control, strong authentication. I mean, we need to make sure that only the appropriate parties can manage our power-consuming devices. Uh, we only want uh, appropriate parties to have access to the details of our records of use. Uh, all of that is going to have to be sorted out, and if, or the Internet of Things is pushing us uh, to solve some of those problems, mm -hmm. just as the power generation um, problem does. Two other things, very briefly. One, obviously, we need to get off of fossil fuel because of the global warming problem. Uh, I'm a big fan of solar mm -hmm. uh, and wind. Uh, they are increasingly efficient. Uh, I have two uh, paid for two um, uh, solar powered cafes uh, in small islands in the middle of Pacific, Kiribati and Kiramas, uh, that are using satellite communication. So solar has been very, very reliable for that. And finally, um, I'm hearing some very interesting um, and positive reports on fusion power. Right. Uh, which, of course, has been a, you know, a sort of a receding possibility over the years. Now I'm hearing uh, that there are some designs that are strikingly um, uh, likely uh, to achieve ignition uh, and um, uh, net positive gain uh, from power generation. And they aren't radioactive uh, mm -hmm. sources. The one right. that I know about most is a boron-based system where you is irradiate the boron with protons, turn it into carbon, uh -huh. and then the carbon splits apart as three alpha particles. Fascinating design. Cheap uh, fuel sources uh, could uh, could create an enormous promise if it all turns out right. Which which one which, is that? I know that there are a few competing uh, startups that are startups working on are different working technologies. There's Tri Alpha, which I think is one of them. Tri Alpha Energy, and th uh, that's the one. <laughs> and then the other one is General Fusion, I think, is the other one, the one up in Canada. But you Tri Alpha well, as the one that you think is is. Uh, you know, Tri Alpha looks to me like the most interesting one. Uh, I visited several of the others, uh, including the Skunk Works uh, up at Lockheed, uh, and many of the others are tokamak-like uh, in their character. Uh, they involve, you know, tritium, like the National Ignition Facility, uh, and those are, you know, expensive uh, fuel sources, whereas boron is uh, actually a fairly inexpensive and uh, uh, significant, uh, uh, in, insignificant supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are actually a number of good questions coming from the audience right now, which I want to get to. But before I do that, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you. Not a curveball. But um, I'm just wondering, when you talk about sort of the ways in which networks and power will, will interplay, do you see a role for the blockchain in that? If you're talking about sort of verified, secure technologies that interact, is, is that where the blockchain comes into play? for sort of real world stuff and security and things like that. So blockchain has a lot of very interesting properties and I thank you for distinguishing blockchain from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a particular uh, application of blockchain. Uh, I don't happen to feel very confident that the Bitcoin paradigm is likely to, to bear fruit partly because of the enormous computational uh, demands that are placed on it for uh, mining the Bitcoins. On the other hand, blockchain has some very attractive properties. I've recently been introduced to a design that uses blockchain for 
uh, high reliability location uh, sensing uh, and validation. So the answer is yes, I see blockchain as a very useful thing. I'm not so persuaded that blockchain in the fully distributed public open uh, implementation is as reliable as a set of uh, what we'll call, uh, what we call whitelist operators of blockchain using the blockchain for reliability and resilience as opposed to uh, you know, secrecy and, and, uh, and full uh, public distribution. Mm. One question that came from the audience from, from someone there was, uh, was a, a question that I feel is, is pretty relevant. So Power Meter was an early Google attempt to get into the energy market. Y'all have Nest now. What else are you going to do? How else will Google play in energy from perhaps a product standpoint? Uh, so first of all, let me say that Google has probably played a larger role in consuming uh, <laughs> renewable sure. power generation. We, we have purchased, you know, 30-year supplies. We right. helped build uh, or in, in funded uh, this this big uh, DC power bus to go from the northeast uh, wind generators all the way into the power uh, distribution system on the northeast uh, part of the U.S. Um, we still have investments in Makani, which is a, 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 an airborne uh, power generation system. So at, I don't have any new things to announce about Google's power generation explorations, but I am uh, confident that uh, we will continue to pursue yeah. acquisition of power sources that are uh, clean in nature and renewable. So uh, that's the most likely path for us uh, there will always be the possibility of another moonshot uh, in the power generation space. We are quite interested in the um, Internet of Things power consuming devices that are remotely controllable, that report their condition, uh, that will provide feedback that we were talking about before. That I think uh, Google will continue to pursue in, in Nest and in other parts. Of, uh, of the, I guess it's now it's the alphabet soup, right. of which <laughs> Google is the letter G, but there right. are others like Nest is the letter N and so on. Right. Um, at what point does Google become a quasi utility of its own or is it already there? How much power does Google generate itself at this point? And I am not sure that I have a good answer. I don't believe, we, we generate a fair amount of solar power because we have coated the tops of many of our buildings uh, with solar power uh, generators. Uh, I don't have a number to give you, I just don't know the answer, but it's probably, I want to say, it, I don't know, 10% or something. I'm making this up, right. so please don't hold well, me to so, that. So, but I don't believe that it's the bulk of our power requirements that are self-generated, but we invest in others that generate power. Right. We're very interested, of course, in hydro because um, that's a very nice renewable resource, at least we hope so. With global warming coming along and the glaciers melting, right. maybe the sources of the hydropower <laughs> will also dry up. That would be a bad thing. Uh, so uh, generally speaking, um, we do our best to uh, consume power that has been produced uh, in a, a clean uh, and uh, in energy um, What's the right word for this? A climate, a climate change sensitive way. Right, right. So this is a, an excellent question that actually came from the audience from Rob Caiello. I hope I pronounced that right. Rob, well done. Um, with so much technological change, uh, many average consumers can get left behind. How does the energy industry bridge the gap between what's available to the highest end of consumers and, and, and what should be possible and, and available to everyone. Is that renewables, is that the solution? And sort of off-grid power? So I think this is also an important challenge. Uh, to give you an example of how hard this is, uh, in Hawaii, for example, where the sun shines a lot of the time, a great many people are investing in solar power, uh, also with the hope they can dump power back into the grid and be paid for that. I think the Hawaiian power company had two problems with this. One was they were, might have been paying too much for the power they were receiving and then wiping out all of their revenue, which means they can't operate. Or they had to make changes to the physical grid itself in order to deal with the fact that power is going in both directions. Right. Another big, uh, big change. Um, as a consumer of power um, and one who lives in the northeast of the U.S., I worry about power outages. We had two very significant week-long power outages uh, in one year 
a couple of years ago, which prompted me to go put in a, uh, a natural gas generator in my backyard. <laughs> but the consequences of doing that are that now I need someone to come and maintain that system. The overhead of maintaining private power generation is very high compared to the overhead of maintaining centralized distribu distributed systems. So what we need to do is find ways of getting the cost down, the maintenance down, right. uh, the monitoring of the system more automated, uh, so that uh, consumers can feel confident mm -hmm. uh, in their um, in their power plants. Uh, Elon Musk, as you know, has uh, taken to uh, putting uh, together batteries right. that you can hang on the wall of the garage, which presumably are the same as the batteries that run the cars, which will certainly mean that he has to produce more batteries and his <laughs> giant 6,500-person you know, battery production plant right. uh, feeding both of those requirements. Uh, so I... I think that we have a ways to go to make all of this stuff easy for everyone to use. And that should be our objective. It should be easy, straightforward, safe mm -hmm. for everyone. Uh, telescoping out a bit um, to, to look more broadly at, at um, technology and, and sort of where it's going, uh, what do you see as the, the top five tech innovations that, that have come up in the past maybe five years, a decade, that are going to influence um, the next decade of, 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 of civilization? Like, what, what's, what's coming that you find interesting and, and innovative? So, uh, I probably the most recent massive uh, invention is, or discovery is the CRISPR-Cas9 DNA editing capability. Uh, it's clear that it has remarkable uh, ability to, for precision. It's not perfect. I am told that sometimes you know, the splicing doesn't work quite right, so you want to be very careful about overly uh, predict, over prediction as to uh, value. But there's no question in my mind that tool is incredible. The second one, I think, is uh, interfacing of our neural system to electrical systems. My wife has a cochlear implant, two of them actually, and those were done 20 years ago and 10 years ago. They are, um, in fact, very powerful, very effective tools. And so that tells us we know a lot about our sensory systems. Optical implants, spinal implants are sure to come. Uh, the third thing, which is almost as, uh, as dramatic, uh, is our ability to analyze what's going on uh, in living systems. Mm. So whether it's MRI scans or internal sensors that are continuously monitoring, uh, like the uh, contact lenses that uh, Google uh, Verily is working on to measure the uh, level of glucose in the tears of the eye and relate that to the level of glucose in blood so the diabetic doesn't have to keep sticking their finger yeah. five, day, five times a day. Those sorts of things for sure. Uh, and then I think it's also fair to say that we are discovering new ways of doing science especially think of astronomy, think of our detectors that are looking for neutrinos that originate outside the galaxy. Look at the recent LIGO gravity wave detector. I am incredibly excited about the fact that we are going to be doing science on a scale we've never done before, thanks to technology. So those are four things, I think. Um, yeah, those are four, yeah. What did I, and, and then, oh, finally, the, um, the artificial intelligence right. neural network, things that just, uh, uh, won four out of five Go games, for example. We can, I don't want to overstate this because games are a very narrow slice of what artificial intelligence could possibly mean. But it does show an, an extraordinary uh, capacity. What's weird about it, of course, is that it's not clear we fully understand why it works. Right. <laughs> and, and so when you, right. you know, when, when, when if somebody said, well, look at all the weights on the neural network. Yeah, I mean, and, and look how well it played the game ago, yeah. If I change this weight by 0.02%, you know what happens. I don't have a clue. Right. So we have a long <laughs> way to go before we fully understand where that's taking us. Well, but isn't well, that but getting isn't close that getting to, close to, to um, actual, uh, true actual true cognition, cognition and intelligence? I mean, you can't explain the reaction that you take as a, as a human. So I... I uh, uh, that's that's right. We, uh, we don't understand. Humans are weird right. anyway. <laughs> Humans uh, are very but, weird. But the real... <laughs> The real fact is that we are uh, approaching a point where we don't have to write programs in order to get programmable behavior because it's learned behavior, which, as you say, is the way human beings function. So that you know, we're moving in that direction, but I think we're also learning how to write ordinary programs at scale. 
uh, doing things, that, for example, in the Google network, uh, on the Google cloud, that are way beyond normal human capacity. And we're taking advantage of that too, like real-time language translations and other kinds of things that, that operate at a such a scale that we could not put human interpreters for doing all of that. Right. Well, so I don't want to sell everyone short. We had promised them a discussion, at least briefly, about the galactic internet. So let's go there. Um, why, how, and what are we doing around the galactic internet? Why are we doing it? What are its applications now? When are we going to Mars? Is Elon going to take us there? Or is it Richard Branson? Or is it, you know, Bezos? Well, well first of all, we're already uh, at Mars with regard to the robots that are in place. The interplanetary network is in operation between Earth, Mars, the International Space Station. Uh, we are standardizing the protocols that are used to do that. We hope that those will be used for subsequent missions, not only to Mars, but to other planets, uh, you know, in the outer and inner solar system and the asteroid belt. Um, and so I, I feel like we're well on our way to incrementally building an interplanetary backbone to support both manned and robot exploration. Getting to Mars is a big challenge, especially if we're going to try to do it with, uh, to support human life. Uh, first, it takes a long time, and second, the challenge is very big to keep people alive for that period of time, possibly through uh, very hazardous uh, you know, solar storms and other things. So I, I am not holding my breath on manned Mars missions, or I should say human Mars missions. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a serious effort right now, funded by DARPA, to design a spacecraft to get to Alpha Centauri in 100 years' time. And that I find... Uh, yeah, uh, credible. Uh, we we have right now the power the uh, the uh, propulsion sources would take sixty five thousand years to get to Alpha Centauri. It's a little long even for an ARPA experiment. But uh, the fact is that ion engines are very likely to uh, reach uh, efficiency and uh, thrust levels get us up to maybe ten or twenty percent the speed of light. You know, if they're functioning over a fifty year period. So I am actually looking forward to the possibility of a mission launch, which could come in the 2030s. Wow. OK, one last question for you, sir. Uh, as the father of the internet, what of your child's behavior has made you want to send it to a timeout room? <laughs> so uh, I'm not the only father, so I am <laughs> Well, many fathers, one of many fathers, the right? The internet itself doesn't really misbehave. What misbehaves are its users. Uh, and uh, it is, it's, it, you know, it's a problem for human beings. Uh, and I'm sorry to say there are some people who don't have other people's best interests at heart. And they are part of the internet environment, just as they are part of our social environment in general. So we live in a society that has this big mix. And we have to cope with that, as we have for many years. Anyone who wants to understand the full breadth of uh, human venal behavior, just read Shakespeare. It's still relevant. This is something <laughs> like the 400th anniversary of his, uh, of his death. Uh, so, I, you know, here we are. Uh, we're human. Uh, we need to do as we have in the past, try to manage our society so that they produce positive outcomes for as many people as possible and try to limit the harm that other people can do. And we have a responsibility as technologists to do what we can, technically speaking. But frankly, it's the sociologists and the politicians and the judicial system and the, you know, our own personal behaviors that will make a difference. Well, with that, sir, I'm going to say thank you so much for the time. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you. It's damn fine. And uh, thank you all for listening. We're going to let you go. You have a hard stop. Thank you so much. OK, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye for now. Bye. See you on the net. <laughs>